Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Sullivan, and I'd like to welcome you to the fifth webinar in our Corporate Solutions Risk Management web webinar series for 2020. Joining me today to discuss the hardening market uh, and hard hardening market solutions, I have Thomas Holzoy, Chief Economist, Americas, Bob Nusslein, Head of Innovative Risk Solutions for the Americas, and Tom Keis, Global Captive Solutions Leader. Before we get started, some logistical items. You could submit your questions at any time during the session via the Q&A chat box. And if you experience any technical issues during the webinar, please hit Control F5. Now I'll turn it over to Thomas Holzoy, who will provide insights on current market trends. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today on the call. I would like to uh, tee this off with a very high level overview of driving factors that economic and more specific to the insurance industry um, that are leading to the current uh, hard market uh, uh, situation. And starting off with the economy, <clears throat> where do we stand? So we have pa we are past the, uh, the phase where uh, everything was dominated by uh, shutting down uh, the economy, and we are in this uh, moved on towards the uh, gradual reopening. Uh, also, this is um, not going as smoothly as hoped. So, economic activity has uh, bottomed out um, in for for any, all the material economies uh, essentially in April, and we see indication for that in high frequency data, mobility data, or um, high frequency consumer spending data. Um, and uh, things are improving from uh, the worst uh, at the, the peak of um, the, uh, the shutdown in April. Uh, but of course, the question is uh, what speed and what shape of the recovery. America is lagging uh, behind Asia and Europe uh, regarding the, the readiness for reopening, and that relates to the uh, pandemic progress. And um, as, uh, as you know, obviously for the US, we have uh, rapidly rising cases uh, but the same is also the case in Latin America, and uh, Canada is holding steady. China went through the experience uh, two months uh, earlier than the rest of the world, so uh, there is there's experience uh, to be seen from there, and uh, China is actually, in that sense, leading um, on the pandemic curve, and then also uh, in terms of reopening uh, the, the economy, and uh, we can... We can um, look there and try to learn and see what, um, how a consumer behavior and uh, the economy looks um, in, these, uh, in these months of uh, gradual reopening. We don't see that the reopening, well, initially we, we get a, a very strong effect and we have seen that in the, in the labor market reports uh, in, in May and uh, June that um, part of the economy will um, Will suffer longer, and think of airlines or uh, the hospitality industry, and uh, we, we expect that uh, at the end of year, um, some things don't get uh, dramatically worse. Um, we are essentially seeing some some 95% uh, economy, and uh, the rest is um, due to behavioral changes and social distancing, um, even beyond um, the the formal. Um, um, government uh, imply its rules, uh, there will simply be um, different uh, behavioral uh, preferences uh, going forward. Labor markets um, have uh, been at the, at the lead of economic indicators going down uh, in, into the shutdown. Uh, it's coming out of this uh, uh, recession, uh, we expect that this will not be as swift and companies will um, not be um, as uh, as uh, quick in, in rehiring uh, due to this heightened uncertainty. The uncertainty relates to uh, the pandemic itself and, and, and the flare-ups and, and second waves, uh, but also simply to um, the, the global environment of um, and uh, the weakness of demand. And so we expect this to be more of a drag and not go on as quickly. Interest rates. Um, uh, Federal Reserve has been very aggressive in uh, in putting out a very um, broad-based and comprehensive stimulus. Interest rates will remain depressed 
for the foreseeable future. So this year, next year, and into 22, uh, we don't essentially see interest rates uh, go anywhere. And as I mentioned before, the second waves, flare-ups, um, uh, are definitely putting a higher level of uncertainty around all these forecasts. So how do some of these trends um, uh, lead up to the market hardening? And I'm shifting now the perspective uh, from, from the pure macro uh, to the, uh, the, PNC, uh, to, um, the insurance industry and their issues coming out of property, out of casualty, and of uh, also uh, relating to cap capital and capacity and uh, alternative capital. So once property is not as clean cut anymore, a, a short tail business, and and we see uh, loss creep in some of uh, cat losses, but then now also related to COVID, we see claims and uh, claims uncertainty uh, related to, to business interruption and, and other areas um, of the P&C industry. So modeling um, has become more difficult. Uh, some of this relates to um, to climate change, and I will uh, touch upon that in, in a second. Um, we have seen social inflation play out uh, in property. Um, uh, let's think about the assignment of benefits in uh, in Florida, for example. The casual side has also seen its its uncertainties, and uh, social inflation is uh, on, on top of the mind there. Uh, but then there is also the economic pressure with, with low interest rates. Um, the, the economics of casualty get more of a headwind, and um, pricing is necessary to um, correction of pricing is needed to to fix these and bring the, uh, the economics back in balance. And then tying things together, um, this increased uncertainty and um, uh, higher risk gap, um, higher risk in the financial markets, um, and the also the ability to earn higher returns in other asset classes have reduced um, investors' interest in alternative capital. And uh, this is, uh, at the moment, uh, not as strong a uh, factor uh, in the market anymore. So as a result, we have seen uh, so a lot of these factors have started um, already before the, uh, the crisis, and, and now they get amplified uh, through the situation. So if we, if we look at uh, rate changes, um, look at the rate uh, indicators, we have seen that um, things have moved moved up, and uh, in the US, that's the left chart here on this um, on, on this slide. Um, we see that um, the rate changes um, are strongly up, and it's uh, it's a mixed bag with commercial auto leading the um, the trends, but uh, commercial property then also uh, strongly uh, moving, and um, uh, liability following as well. And this again, it's not just um, economic factors, but uh, we have seen cat losses, we have seen social inflation losses, uh, and we have seen a uh, yeah, heightened loss activity in, on the commercial auto side. And these are these, it's a compounding um, effect of uh, a couple of factors. The right side of the chart shows that this is actually a global phenomenon, and we see rates, uh, commercial rates, uh, trending up um, in various regions. Uh, particularly strongly so in the ones where we have seen uh, where we had <coughs> uh, cat activity uh, prior years. I mentioned social inflation, and uh, just mentioning uh, briefly that uh, it is um, a phenomenon that uh, is not lifting um, overall claims uh, trends up uh, very clearly yet, but it is a it's a, basically a shift of the probability distribution. And we see a higher frequency of very large claims. And uh, these are <coughs> uh, particularly with, um, concentrated uh, in southeastern states and in the motor and trucking. And so there's um, it's a trend where um, claims, large claims, um, are disconnected essentially from, from economic drivers. And um, the, um, yeah, this has been driving uh, the claims experience of, of the insurance industry, even though that uh, the the average claim has not been affected that much, it is really uh, the the very uh, on the very top uh, higher occurrence of very large claims, which makes it more difficult to to underwrite and to um, to um, 
to calculate assess this risk. Another area where this is the case uh, is NAT caps, and we have seen over the last uh, decade um, a shift, a trend towards um, more frequent large catastrophes coming from secondary perils. And so these are these are risks like floods, thunderstorms, drought, uh, wildfires, and and winter storms. And uh, so the overall the claims uh, burden of the of the industry is not so much driven by um, by winter uh, by um, uh, hurricanes um, and um, just the traditional the, the largest loss driver on the cat loss side. Earthquakes uh, are large in terms of exposure. We didn't have a lot of activity, uh, but we see more of the uh, of these so-called secondary perils. And there, um, in terms of um, the contribution to um, to losses, um, are actually now the the dominant driver. And the picture um, would be even stronger. I show here on this, this graph on the right side: 60% of uh, of losses for the last decade have been caused by secondary perils. Uh, if we would carve out the, the flood-related losses from events like Hurricane Harvey, uh, then the number would be even larger. One of these contributing fa factors is, is climate change. And I want to touch briefly upon this, uh, is this slide here. Um, there are factors uh, that uh, add to, to model uncertainty. And uh, some of these trends um, we understand better. There's more scientific evidence, and uh, we can see um, the, the reflection in these lost data. And we see it relating to, to secondary perils more clearly than to hurricane losses, for example. But uh, trends like increasing uh, average temperatures uh, have led to um, rising sea levels. And this is correlated or relates to uh, storm surges. Uh, we also see more extreme temperatures, so extreme cold, extreme heat. And this is uh, driving heat waves, drought, uh, and, uh, and wildfires. And again, this is uh, we can see uh, the reflection of this in our data. So there is scientific evidence and, and the quantitative evidence. Uh, they line up very well. And it's also a lot of observations of these uh, of these events, uh, so that we can better understand this. Um, we also see with with higher higher temperatures, more moisture in the air, and uh, we see more extreme rainfall and uh, river flood floods, inland floods. Uh, other impacts are um, discussed and analyzed, but the the, the, the confidence about the uh, the conclusion is lower so far. And this relates to the frequency of, uh, of um, uh, hurricanes, winter storms, hail, and tornado. Um, there is evidence uh, that they are also impacted by cl climate change. But the understanding of the science and of the, the, the reflection modeling uh, need more work to be done, and the, the confidence is lower around these. But overall, the picture here is, again, that um, these risks are more difficult to um, to model, and uh, another aspect of it is that the these cat risks are not so much concentrated anymore in uh, California for earthquake uh, or the New Madrid area, and uh, to southeast for um, hurricane risk, but uh, flood and um, uh, tornadoes and uh, wildfires they, they spread uh, much broader over the country. So there is there is an increased exposure. Um, to, to cat losses um, uh, across the country. So summing this up, um, insurance market trends. Um, in the short term, we have a strong influence uh, from the COVID crisis. There is there's a, a slump in demand due to uh, lower economic uh, activity. Insurance companies' balance sheets are exposed to, to financial market stress and cash flow stress. and um, Combined with um, the, these aspects, what I just showed before, of some increased modeling uncertainty, um, capital is scarcer and risk is uh, risk perception is up, and uh, this is um, one of the drivers of the, the hardening market, and one of the conclusions or um, reactions 
is uh, usually a flight to quality from the uh, point of view of the clients. Longer term, we see uh, risks um, that these uh, uh, large amount of, of government uh, of uh, government debt and demonetization through central banks uh, could lead to to inflation. Uh, so there's there's more risk and, and economic extreme scenarios coming from that. Low investment yields are here to stay. They put stress on the economics of uh, of insurance by lower um, investment returns. Risk awareness is up, and um, personal line side that relates to mortality and critical illness, health. Uh, on the commercial side, of course, this relates to business interruption. CBI and non-damage business interruption. And another trend coming out of um, the way how we do business right now, and um, as seen by our webinar right now, digitization um, is, will become more of, a, of the norm and expectation um, on the side of customers. And this will, uh, this will advance and create a push for the insurance industry uh, where digitization has been a trend for the last three, four years, but to, to accelerate the movement on that. With that, I'm closing here my part, and I'm handing this over to Bob now. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I just had to uh, unmute. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Chris uh, Sullivan introduced uh, Tom and I, but I just wanted to take uh, just a, a brief moment to introduce you to the rest of the Innovative Risk Solutions team for North America. You have Scott Carpentieri and Cole Mayer uh, out uh, on the West Coast. Uh, a lot of you may know them. Uh, Scott's in Los Angeles, Cole in San Francisco. And then back east, we have Todd Chima uh, in New York with Patrick Hauser and I, and then Yusef Baki in Toronto. So that rounds out uh, the, uh, the IRS uh, Innovative Risk Solutions North America team. And then, as Chris mentioned, uh, um, uh, Tom Keist is a uh, global captive solutions leader and uh, support for our North American team and all the other regions. So um, Thomas talked uh, about uh, trends in the market. So clearly, uh, 2019 was a firming year for the market, if not hardening. Uh, 2020 uh, was more of the same and, and possibly even worse, where the market was hardening even further. And then on top of that, also, as Thomas mentioned, COVID-19 hit. So that was a huge impact to uh, insurers and insureds. Uh, insurers uh, need now to get back to profitability, uh, improve their combined ratios. So what does the, that mean, really? Rate increases. So um, insureds now are facing rate increases uh, not only rate increases, but capacity constraints, uh, tighter language, fewer uh, manuscripted uh, policies, uh, greater dependence on larger uh, SIRs and deductibles, higher use of captives, uh, another form of self-insured retention, along with uh, higher deductibles. So uh, lots of issues uh, in, in the hardening market that COVID-19 compounded even further. So what are the needs? Uh, the needs are basically everything to combat uh, those those trends. Uh, gaps in insurance programs <clears throat> need to be filled. Uh, there needs to be more uh, capacity uh, found elsewhere in the insurance or possibly even the broader capital markets. There needs to be ways to reduce volatility, mostly from uh, the gaps in cover that's appearing in the larger SIRs and deductibles and the use of captives. Um, and then, obviously, budget certainty, getting back to the ability to budget uh, um, adequately without uh, large shocks to insurance spends uh, each year. So a lot of the solutions, looking at the third column here, uh, we, we see uh, coming back to prominence in a hardening, if not hard, uh, market. Uh, parametric NatCat, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Non-physical damage business interruption covers, CAT or non-NatCat. Uh, and then uh, multi-year NatCat carve-outs, uh, and then captive protections. And the need for fronting uh, and ASL covers, and then my colleague Tom Keist will talk about virtual captives and alternative uh, to captives. So um, if we move on, Hang on one second. Okay. Took a while for the palm tree to come up. All right. So first of all, we've had 
uh, another webinar on parametric NatCat and weather solutions a while back that uh, my colleague Cole Mayer did. So we're not going to go into that in anywhere near as much detail as, as before. But for those who did not uh, see that uh, webinar, what is a, a parametric NatCat cover? It's uh, an indexed uh, insurance cover. Uh, the payout is made by insurer to insured uh, when the threshold is hit. The most common covers are named windstorm, hurricane, tropical storm, and, uh, and earthquake. Uh, so thresholds for named windstorm could be wind speed exceedance in miles per hour. Uh, thresholds for shake intensity uh, for earthquake could be shake intensity in percent uh, of gravity. Uh, so now, what are the benefits of a, a parametric NatCat cover, particularly uh, in a hard market? So. Uh, the, the main benefit is that parametric covers complement or supplement uh, uninsured or uninsurable risk. They don't really replace or very, not very often replace traditional insurance. It's almost always a complement to fill in gaps, a difference of conditions cover. One of the main uh, advantages or benefits that insureds uh, derive from parametric NatCat covers are to uh, avoid some of the limitations of a traditional uh, all-risk uh, PDBI uh, policy. Um, time element coverages, business interruption and extra expense uh, are paid resulting from physical damage. So if you have an event, a hurricane or an earthquake, that uh, damages the, the, your, your assets uh, modestly, there may not be that much uh, cover uh, coming from the traditional uh, policy for time element, business interruption and extra expense. So parametric covers, NatCat and weather are very broad. Uh, 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 business interruption and all expenses associated with the event are, are, are paid even when they do not result from physical damage. And then also uh, parametric NatCat covers can be used uh, for physical damage covers as well. Uh, they also infill uh, SIRs, uh, percent SIRs. Uh, the deductible buy-down market is becoming more scarce in uh, a hardening market. Uh, so uh, percent deductibles for NatCat uh, represent large uh, dollar uh, loss retention and uh, greater volatility for insureds. Uh, another benefit in the center there is a fast payout. Uh, parametric NatCat covers don't follow a traditional uh, claims adjustment process. Uh, it's a very formulaic payout. Uh, the third-party independent data provider uh, provides uh, data on wind speed, shake intensity. Uh, the calculation agent looks at uh, policy and determines how much of the, uh, the, the limit uh, has been paid out. Shortly after that, a payment is made to insured, and then down the road, 12 to 18 months, a very simple one-page attestation uh, that a loss that uh, insured uh, had losses greater than or equal to the amount uh, paid them uh, is due. So very simple, very quick process, usually uh, payouts within 30 days or less. Uh, as I mentioned before, the main parametric uh, perils, uh, NatCat perils are earthquake, hurricane, and hail is becoming more prominent. The hail market has uh, hardened uh, dramatically, so uh, there is uh, parametric hail uh, out in the market now. I think we're going to be doing a webinar on parametric hail as a follow-up to this one in, in a month or so. So stay tuned on that. Uh, other parametric triggers uh, are, uh, that are commonly done are deficit and excess rain, rainfall, temperature, storm surge, river height, uh, and then non-NatCat and weather related uh, hosp hospitality, occupancy rates, uh, revenue per room, transportation volumes, air, rail, uh, things like that, foot traffic of people, uh, different uh, types of indices. Now. Um, moving on here, uh, some of the key features of the Swiss Re Storm and Quake uh, parametric NatCat products are, I mentioned it's an index cover, payout made after an index value is exceeded, uh, the use of independent third-party data providers. Now, if you look to the right on the screen, you could see uh, a colorful uh, picture uh, on the top. That's Hurricane Michael. Uh, from 2018 making landfall uh, in the panhandle of Florida. 
Uh, and the source of that is uh, the uh, third-party independent data provider, RMS HWIND. HWIND is a spinoff of, of uh, NHC that RMS acquired, I don't know, five or so years ago. And they uh, provide the best technology to derive very granular uh, uh, maximum one minute sustained wind speeds for hurricanes over their entire track. So a real good, robust, independent mechanism for settlement of policies. Now below, you can see another colorful chart. That's uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, a shake map, a USGS shake map. And that's uh, uh, a colorful picture of uh, the Northridge California earthquake in 1994. So you could see, this is simplified for this purpose, but you could see the red colors are where shake intensity is greatest, orange to yellow, still very high, and then the warmer or softer uh, colors, blues and greens, is where shake intensity was less. And there's obviously a lot of data that goes behind uh, all of all of that uh, colorful chart. So you can see some of the other components or features of uh, storm and quake. Uh, parametric covers are becoming far more common. Lots of insureds uh, now are buying them uh, to complement their traditional uh, insurance programs. And the pace is, uh, is speeding up in, in the hardening market. Okay, let me just make sure that the pictures come in now. Okay. All right, there they are. Okay, now some other solutions uh, for uh, a hardening market. Uh, one of the others mentioned on a prior page is a multi-year NatCat carve-out. Now, this uh, type of structure uh, clearly is more prevalent in a harder market. You see them occasionally in a, in a softer to stable market to lock in capacity at a fixed price over a long term. But the, the, uh, the, the needs and benefits and drivers of these <clears throat> in a harder market uh, differ a little bit. They're more to generate uh, capacity. You could see in that first layer where you have the blue and the blue rectangle and the uh, rose colored rectangle and the green arrow. Uh, in uh, the 60% blue portion of that all risk PDBI layer, um, you would take uh, carve out the NatCat the NAT exposure, the hurricane or windstorm. And what that does is really relieve some of the traditional all-risk PDBI insurers whose all-risk capacity may be constrained by uh, more problematic uh, uh, natural catastrophe covers. So if you pull those out, the NatCat, find uh, a better home for them, Swiss Re and several others, that uh, play in this area, then uh, capacity uh, may be more uh, plentiful uh, in the blue area without the burden of NatCat for some insurers. So it's a mechanism to get capacity, find uh, a reasonable price, and try to dampen uh, the, uh, the, the price increases for a very volatile NatCat exposed primary layer. And then you could see in the rose uh, rectangle that uh, a little less than half of the uh, 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 shared and layered participants in, the, in that layer uh, retain NatCat. They do an annual renewable program, uh, all risk including NatCat. The carve out is just NatCat, usually done on a three year basis, but we've seen some staggered with two, three, five year uh, tranches to fill out that, that blue part of the layer. Now, moving on. <clears throat> When captives are used more in a hardening market, uh, then captive fronting uh, becomes more prevalent too. So some of the features uh, of, a, of a front that are important are really uh, a strong rating. Obviously, uh, um, uh, stakeholders are looking uh, for a high quality insurer when they're looking to evidence cover. Uh, the uh, front is going to need a very strong international network with an ability to issue local paper in lots of jurisdictions around the world. Strong service and administration of these programs is of paramount importance. There's a need to issue policies in lots of different countries, maybe a master non-admitted program, move funds, collect premiums, uh, uh, remit reinsurance premiums, pay claims in lots of different areas. So service is important. And then 
uh, often we see these programs where uh, they're without a captive behind them, but uh, it's a structured fronting program primarily uh, used to evidence cover, and they may have an indemnity agreement. So insurer will pay and then be reimbursed for any losses paid or expenses incurred. So lots of different uh, captive fronting or even uh, structured uh, uh, fronting uh, programs in a harder market. Now over on the right, uh, I don't want to take up Tom Kais' time, but over on the right is another uh, prevalent structure that's used in a hardening market, uh, the captive aggregate stop-loss cover. So as captives become uh, more commonly used and more widely used, they're filling in gaps, they're taking larger layers, uh, they're trying to insulate uh, um, um, uh, parent insured from, from high, higher prices in, in, a, in a volatile market. So in this case, in the red layer, captive takes uh, first loss, maybe 50 to 100 million uh, in the aggregate in that layer, and then seeks um, an aggregate stop loss cover for a second and third uh, event covers or attaching out in the tail in a cumulative loss distribution curve that maybe 80, 85, 90, 95% confidence level of losses wherever makes sense for insurer and uh, insured. Uh, the, the captive is usually looking to protect capital and surplus from large shock losses, either one single loss or losses in the aggregate. So I'll pause there and hand the baton over to Tom Keist, who will talk about virtual captives. Tom? Thanks, Paul. So I'm here. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, Bob just talked about captives, but of course, not everyone already does have a captive. And when you are in a hard market situation, the question is, what can you do if you if you do not have a captive yet? And that's when an alternative to setting up a real captive can come into play. And we call it the virtual captive. And I would like to talk a little bit about who it is for, what it is, how it works, and also give you an example later on. So who is it for? It is a, a solution for uh, corporates who have basically decided that a captive would be the right answer to their insurance needs. So that decision basically already happened when uh, they start talking about the virtual captive with us. So it is obviously a hard market solution. Uh, it's something that comes up in these times as we have now. Uh, it is a solution if the time, cost and complexities of actually setting up and running a captive is a hurdle and a big consideration uh, to the client. And last but not least, if potential exit options are also considered. As you know, uh, if you have established a captive uh, and once you decide you know, that the market situation is such that my risk retention vehicle doesn't have to be a captive anymore, you cannot just close the doors. So it's, 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 a more, it's much more difficult. Whereas with a virtual captive, the exit options are actually more flexible. So how does it work? Uh, it's, it's basically simple. It is a multi-year insurance agreement which emulates the mechanics of a traditional captive. And when I say the mechanics, I mean the financial mechanics. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's not any other of the mechanics of a captive, so cannot be, uh, uh, you know, the risk management body itself and so forth. But the financial mechanics of a traditional captive can be emulated with a virtual captive. Uh, of course, for this, you need to have some contractual element in that multi-year insurance agreement to make it emulating the mechanics of a captive. And first of all, it is a always has to be a multi-year agreement because uh, the risk financing happens over time, as is the case with a real captive. Number two, the premium contribution to the virtual captive program implicitly finances a larger part of the risk over time, which means that if you're out there to just 
uh, uh, save some cash on premium spend, uh, this might not be the right answer. Because as with the captive, the, the, basically the contributions that flow to the captive or the virtual captive, they are there to in total uh, uh, finance the expected loss that you have within the captive layer. But because of that, there comes number three, right? You have a low claims bonus that comes due. And it becomes due at the end of the period. In a real captive situation, if you have an underwriting profit in the captive, you will pay a dividend. The captive will pay a dividend to the parent. In the case of a virtual captive, this is a low claims bonus. Uh, on the other hand, and that's the last point, we can also introduce additional premium features which are optional, they're not always there, it's not standard, but they can be there. Uh, and they, uh, they come into play if the losses uh, exceed the, uh, the ex expected losses that were there. And it would equivalent the situation when a captive would do a call for additional capital. So this is the equivalent to a call for additional capital in a captive, in a real captive situation. So as you can see, with just a number of, of uh, structural elements in, a, in an insurance agreement, you can really replicate or emulate the mechanics of the traditional capi uh, cap uh, captive. Now, what are the advantages? I uh, quickly want to uh, point out some of them. And there's, the list is basically uh, longer than this, but I think these are the key ones. Uh, so, number one, of course, uh, by entering a virtual captive agreement uh, with Swiss Corporate Solutions, you do not have the setup costs and efforts you need to set up a, a captive. You do not need the regulatory approvals or to set up any reportings with regulators. Uh, and you do not have expenses for running the captive afterwards. All of this is basically done by Swiss Corporate Solutions in the normal course of our business. This is what we do every day. And therefore, uh, it's basically economies of scale that we can use uh, by providing our own balance sheet uh, for such a structure. Uh, number four, clearly, uh, you know, a, a virtual captive can be implemented quite uh, quickly. Uh, when you think about uh, setting up a real captive, you think about between three and six months on average. I know in uh, in some states in the U.S. it can go much quicker, uh, but you know on average on a worldwide basis it's probably three to six months. And uh, in 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 reality, I've seen a lot of cases where it ended up taking a year or more. Whereas a virtual captive, which is a multi-year insurance agreement, this can go much much faster. Uh, last but not least, uh, keep in mind that if you enter a insurance agreement with uh, with Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, you have the Swiss Re Group's financial strength behind, which is uh, very often a strong argument for uh, for uh, actually dealing with us. What I would like, and this is very important to me, what I want to uh, make very very clear here is that. Uh, if we look at the commercial context of this product and also what it isn't, I want to point out a number of uh, very important things. What we are trying to do is emulating the mechanics of a traditional captive, nothing else. We do that with the captive's well-established risk financing me mechanism as well as tax and, and accounting treatment. So. If we talk about uh, the old ancient 90s, we did have structures that were there to optimize tax situations and accounting situations, and those times are over. In the meantime, the whole industry has moved on, regulation has moved on, legislation has moved on, and therefore this is completely out of scope. And it is also completely out of scope here. What we are trying to do is emulating the mechanics of a captive. And therefore, what we can say is that the motivation uh, compared to the past is completely different. The motivation is a need for setting up a captive. And it's looking for alternatives to implement that need. 
Uh, so, and virtual captive is a alternative to setting up a real captive. Number two, the transparency is completely different. So we have now agreements that are clear, they're explicitly connected to each other, there are no side letters, no implicit agreements whatsoever. So this is a completely different ballgame. Last but not least, in, the, in every agreement we do have the necessary warranties that actually the, the, the accounting is mirrored uh, between Swiss Recovery Solutions and the client. So we want to have a mirrored accounting and also reporting. And there are, these are strict obligations in the policy. Uh, and therefore, uh, again, also the relationship with the client, the, the trust and the workings of this are not comparable to what we looked at 20 years ago. So this was very important to me. I hope uh, this is also a good thing to see for you. Last but not least, I would like to go into a, a small uh, example. It is a, a very simplified example. We actually did apply this. Uh, it, so this is a live example, but it is extremely simple, uh, simple and therefore not likely to be often repeated, but it makes the point quite nicely. So this slide is busy uh, and I would like to go from the left to the right. <coughs> On the left, utmost left, you see uh, today's client situation. So there's a business unit deductible of, for example, 1 million and the insurance program attaching above. And now because of the current hard market situation and a, a good advice by the client's broker, uh, it was decided that actually the attachment point, the better attachment point for the traditional insurance program is now 10 million. But between the 10 million and the, now the 1 million, there should be a captive applied because of the benefits that you have by having a captive. Now, they have come to us for, to discuss the virtual captive and we applied a virtual captive instead. So this is what I call now the virtual captive layer. This is the layer 9XS1. And now in the blue box, you can see how this works. So the virtual captive program is, for example, a three-year program in this case, can be up to five years. And it's, uh, it, uh, it covers 9 million XS1 million each and every loss. And we have here an 80 million, 18 million uh, term aggregate limit. Now, if you go to the bottom of the box, you can see that the premium says 3 million plus X. Now, you, you, you actually could not do this, right? You could not say 3 million plus X because it's all in one, uh, one piece. But just to make this illustration better, I put it this way. And with the 3 million, you can see every year 3 million adds up to 9 million, obviously. The first full loss is financed implicitly with the premium, whereas the second possible full loss is, is, uh, is a risk to the balance sheet involved. Now, if this would be a real captive, obviously the second loss uh, risk would be to the balance sheet of the captive and the capital of the captive. Because it's a virtual captive uh, with Swiss Corporate Solutions, it's of course our balance sheet that is at risk. And for this, we ask for a respective risk cost. So if you go now to the bottom left of this uh, slide, you see the X there. The X is the risk and other costs. I think risk cost is clear. The other costs are basically the costs for, uh, for providing our infrastructure to this virtual captive program. This includes uh, capital underpinning, it includes uh, some, uh, some credit risk costs and, uh, and so forth. So basically the cost for our infrastructure. On the right side you see three loss scenarios I would like to go through quickly. Uh, so, the in, so the money flow within the virtual captive would look as follows. In a loss, no loss scenario, scenario, you have the premiums flowing in year one, year two, year three. And because there is no loss, after the deductions of X, which I just talked about, uh, a low claims bonus comes due to the client. Now, <clears throat> uh, of course, if this would be a real captive, this low claims bonus would be the dividend that is paid to the 
to the to the parent. So this is the equivalent. In the middle, you have a loss scenario, which still provides some low claims bonus without going into the detail. But then the full loss scenario on the bottom, you can see uh, we can assume that the 18 million uh, uh, two losses have happened, and because uh, of that, of course, there is an ultimate loss to Swiss Re Corporate Solutions balance sheet. And I think I'm right on time now, and we can move to the questions. Chris, do you thank want you, to Tom. Lead up? Absolutely, thank you, Tom, um, and thank you to Thomas and Bob as well. Uh, that was fantastic. We we do have a lot of questions that have come in, um, so we want to spend about uh, 10, 11 minutes um, addressing those. Uh, so, Bob Musline, I'll start off uh, with a question for you. Uh, why are parametric NatCat covers a hard market solution? Okay, yeah. Par well, they're, they're, um, they're an all-market solution, but they're becoming more prevalent uh, in, in the hard market because as uh, capacity is constrained in the hard market, it's usually constrained in the more troubling areas for hurricane and earthquake uh, maybe flood and other things like that. So that leads to gaps in traditional programs. So these gaps need to be filled, whether it's greater capacity, deductible infill, uh, this difference of conditions cover, uh, um, uh, lower amounts of sublimits for things like service interruption, uh, uh, BI, things like that. And in, um, uh, in a hard market, particularly one that we have right now where we have COVID-19, top line and bottom line of, um, of uh, insureds are, are impacted. So liquidity uh, is important. So when you have a mechanism that could pay out uh, in, a, in a disaster case very quickly in 30 days or less, uh, that's, a, that's a huge advantage and a, and a, and a uh, liquidity, a source of liquidity that insureds may not have. So I, I think th th those are most of the reasons why it's a, uh, why parametric NACAC covers are a hard market solution. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Tom Keist, question for you. I'm actually going to combine two questions here. Um, one being, what would be the maximum number of years Swiss Re would consider in a virtual captive program? Is 10 years realistic? And then second, are there use cases for setting up a virtual captive if a company already has an established captive? Okay, so question number one. Um, the answer is usually we go up to five years for an initial uh, virtual captive agreement. Uh, of course, we have actually uh, uh, cases which after five years then renewed and were basically rolled, rolled over and basically extended. And this, this, this can easily happen. So, but up front, we will probably not go beyond five years. Uh, and the second question was, sorry about our uh, use cases. Uh, yes, we do have use cases. And we do have also use cases for uh, corporates who have already also captives established. The answer is yes. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and now a question for Thomas. Um, with climate changes and effects on certain perils more frequently, will it increase cat pricing of U.S. exposure substantially? Yeah, so we, um, I'm giving there a typical economist answer, which would say it, it depends. So um, not all not all perils are um, are equally affected, and um, climate change is, is clearly a long-term trend, and, and cat prices are um, reflecting the current risk. So so the the question is whether um, we have uh, certain perils where um, we realize that, uh, that climate change is already driving it and has led to underpricing. And there clearly are, are pockets um, of, of, these, uh, um, of these risks. Um, it's not a, not a statement um, where it would say substantially for the, for the overall market uh, we would need to be looked at more differentiated um, at the current moment. And then going forward, uh, the, these trends, if if they are primarily driving up uh, loss experience, uh, loss expectations, 
um, then this would also, uh, in the longer run, lead to an, to an upward trend in uh, needed premiums. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, question for you, Bob Nussline. Um Is the multi-year NatCat carve-out used for builder's risk, and can it be applied to blanket cover for overall projects? Um, it's, uh, the NAT, multi-year NatCat carve-out has been used uh, for builder's risk application uh, in the past, and we're looking at a couple of them uh, right now, us and, and others uh, in the market. Um, uh, builder's risk doesn't always uh, address natural catastrophes well or fully, uh, and in a hardening market, just like NatCat capacity could be constrained in a traditional program, it could even be more constrained in a, in a builder's risk program because you're really looking at the cover extending out over, over multiple years, whether it's a 24-month, 36-month uh, construction period, it becomes a little bit more problematic, often maybe sublimited. So uh, a multi-year multi NACAC carve-out uh, for a hurricane or, or earthquake could, could fit nicely. Um, in, in, a, in addition, though, I think uh, parametric covers, we see those, uh, parametric uh, named windstorm and parametric hurricane, uh, more often uh, requested as a, a supplement to a traditional builder's risk uh, because of the, um, the, 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 the lack of the of delayed startup coverage, DSU coverage, uh, in, a, in a traditional program. So uh, where you, when you move away from an indemnity cover and move to a parametric cover, uh, the, the market cares less about whether it's uh, for delayed startup, uh, higher interest costs, or, or replacing steel and concrete, and, or, or extra expenses to get back on schedule, things like that. So we really see parametric covers uh, uh, dovetailing or being used to supplement builder's risk more than NatCat carve-outs, but we see, see those too. E either could be. Um, looking at them over uh, a range of projects, or a portfolio of projects becomes uh, a little bit more difficult because uh, the uh, the catastrophe uh, risk is is different. You could have one that's wind exposed, one hurricane exposed, one uh, flood exposed. So you have to know uh, the parameters and be able to price uh, each each one of these. But we certainly can look at uh, multiple projects over over that, Por making a portfolio out of it up front before we know geography and actual location and term uh, could lead to changes in price and structure, but not, not out of the question. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Tom Keist, question for you. Uh, can the virtual captive be used to lower deductibles where a company has different businesses with different risk tolerances or profiles. Yeah, we will have to look at it, but in uh, essentially, yes, that's actually often the case. So virtual captive very often, uh, that you know, the, the, the virtual captive layer or the captive layer is a difference between layer, right? So you have various, uh, various unit deductibles and the captive layer goes up to a certain limit. So the difference between, you, you have that very often. Uh, and one more back to you, Tom. Um, I understand the virtual captive concept contains low claim bonus features. Does a low claim bonus have to be paid out to the client or can it be used for an extension, for example? Very good question. The answer is yes. We actually have, uh, in most uh, situations, uh, also in Europe uh, especially, uh, where the low claims bonus is used to extend, uh, maybe to increase the limit or to add another line of business or, or, other, or other, other possibilities, but it can be reused. Thank you. Uh, question, Bob Nussline, back to you. If you trigger a NACAC policy, um, and I'm, I'm presuming parametric, um, but it actually doesn't have a loss, is the payment taxable? Well, um, the, the, the broader question um, stemming from that question is really the difference, uh, you know, uh, how is parametric insurance possibly different than uh, a parametric uh, derivative. So one of the basic tenets of insurance is that you have to have uh, a loss. There can't be a windfall profit. 
So you have to have insurable interest. Uh, there has to be uh, some financial loss, although the verification or certification of that loss is very simple. If, uh, for example, if uh, a 10 million limit is paid out and then over the 12 to 18 month period, uh, um, the, the client, uh, the insured, uh, can't uh, uh, evidence that they've had more than, say, $8 million of losses. There is usually uh, a true-up uh, where uh, the $10 million paid, $2 million would be repaid back uh, to insurer. Um, so uh, just like in any other insurance program, there is no chance for a windfall profit. Uh, the loss recovery offsets – the loss recovery from insurer offsets uh, the loss. Now, however, in a derivative, there is no uh, requirement to prove uh, that there, uh, there is a loss. It's just a financial uh, agreement between two parties. If the trigger is hit, a payment is made. Whether it uh, re results in a windfall profit, uh, it doesn't matter. And also, there's no requirement for insurable interest. However, we see uh, corporate customers buying either uh, parametric insurance or parametric derivatives uh, to to hedge, hedge their risk, not to speculate. Uh, so uh, typically they're looking for cover uh, to hedge either physical damage risk or extra expenses. Um, uh, tax uh, would, again, we have to be very careful because we're not tax uh, advisors and uh, whoever asks the question should seek out uh, appropriate uh, tax and legal advice on tax questions, but a derivative uh, payment uh, that does not hedge would likely hedge a loss would likely be be taxed. But please seek out uh, appropriate professional guidance. Swiss Re are not tax advisors. Tom Keist, uh, over to you. I'm going to combine a few here. Um, is there a fee to set up a virtual captive? Um, are there capital requirements for virtual captives? And can Swiss Re offer virtual captive outside? of North America? Uh, so there is no there is no fee, no. We have in our costing implicitly, of course, the cost for providing our infrastructure. Uh, that is in the price, but there is no there is no explicit fee. Uh, then are there capital requirements? No. Nothing needs to be capitalized, and that's, I think, one of the key advantages of uh, you know, an entering a virtual captive program with us, is that there is no, there are no capital injections needed. There are, you know, as a standard, we don't need any collaterals for anything. Uh, so this is <clears throat> this is, makes it much more simple uh, for uh, for implementation. And uh, virtual captive outside of North America, uh, <clears throat> of I mean, of course, uh, we can do, uh, we can do, uh, uh, it depends, of course, what <clears throat> the virtual captive would be covering, what risks, and we need to be, of course, able to uh, use still our license in the places where we provide coverage. <clears throat> and the other thing is, of course, that uh, we would need to carefully consider what we do, because as I mentioned in one of my slides, <clears throat> very clearly what we what we do not want to do is we do not want, intend to support any uh, any products which optimize tax situations. That's not the purpose of this. So what we're trying to do is emulating the mechanics of a <clears throat> real captive, and we would seek to have a very similar also legal setup. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so that's all the time we have today. Um, there were a number of questions that we didn't get the chance to address for you, and we will reach out to you personally with answers to those questions. Um, and I want to again thank our speakers uh, today um, and to you, the audience, for spending an hour with us. We hope you found this to be insightful. Uh, we will be sharing a copy of the recording in the coming days in case you want to listen again or, or share with, with colleagues. Uh, and in the meantime, please feel free to reach out um, to, to any of us today uh, with questions um, or anything you think we could assist you with. And if you have a second, I'm going to launch a poll here and you can let us know your thoughts on uh, today's session. Um, lastly, we have coming up very soon a, a number of webinars. Next week on July 22nd, 
we're going to present our uh, new parametric solution for HAIL. Um, so you'll see invitations coming very shortly for that. Uh, and then we're going to take a break in August and continue programming in the fall with, with a number of um, opportunities to present the topics to you starting in September. So stay tuned for invitations uh, and watch the Swiss Re Corporate Solutions LinkedIn, again, uh, LinkedIn account. Um, thank you again and hope to speak with you soon and enjoy the rest of your day.